Thank you very much, and thank you for this invitation. It's been a wonderful day to see what uh, all of you are doing. So interesting. So I cannot be appreciative enough. Thank you so much. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about this problem. So the title is not very terrible, but you can see right away what this is about. So I think I left out uh, what has happened. I was not planning for biology, so probably people want to see that. So, okay, so this presentation deals with three boundary aggregates that will be water based thermonic liquid crystals, molecular materials, okay, and their analogs in condensed spaces of DNA. So, both free in vitro solutions as well as in vivo publish viral genome, and these are bacteriophage viruses. So, basically, here there's two systems. Um, one is really, you, know, you can find it in the supermarket, food dyes, yellow that you eat in Doritos and all this stuff is exactly this liquid crystal. And then also in a collection of new drugs, and especially uh, anti asthmatic drug. But then uh, the physical features and many of the mathematical features run along condensed phases of DNA. So when you have DNA condensed, either in a free in vitro solution, right, or in viruses, in actual viruses. And in particular, thinking about viruses that infect bacteria, and they are more bacterial. Okay. So this will give us some kind of transition on how to use, say, lab experiments uh, at the optical range, you know, uh, to kind of give insight into what happens at uh, the DNA level. So, now one thing in common among these two, say, molecular liquid crystals and DNA, is that both phases are really find, found in what's called the hexagonal or columnar chromonic liquid crystal phase. So this is not the phase that is as well known as the uh, cosmetics or pneumatics that mean, you know, everybody has heard of, but it's just a different phase. Okay, and I will explain in a moment what it is. So one main feature of what I'm going to explain is the energy, it's a competition between the elasticity of bending and the anisotropy, uh, anisotropic surface energy, and this in particular promotes torus-like structures that reflect this hexagonal symmetry. So now the, also the other difference is that the liquid crystal condensates, right, are about 10 times 10 to the fifth times the size of the DNA analogs. So, and again, as I said, bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria, and right now are being studied in the context of new therapies for bacteria resistant antibiotics. So, now the work presented here is directly, I mean, it's based it's, uh, in the lab, uh, the lab experiments on liquid crystals by the physicists, so it's three experimental components. Uh, Ken Ohio, well, in Argonne, was also uh, the same people had to go to Argonne because we really didn't have enough precision in, in Ken, so more, uh, more powerful equipment, visualization equipment was needed. And then in the in Kiev, um, so which they kept working through, <laughs> through the publication day, which is really amazing. And then the other part of liquid crystals, so we have vital imaging, and some of them come from the math microbiologists in the, the UC Davis group that they work with. Okay, so let's see. So now I'm going to start with uh, just a quick presentation to a uh, good reminder of uh, the liquid crystals that uh, you know everybody has heard most of. So, okay, we know the liquid crystals are intermediate between salt and liquid, and they flow like liquids, right? But the constituent molecules retain orientational and perhaps a partial positional logarithm. You know, the very well known pneumatic, right, with the directed field N, this average molecular orientation, and then there's metric A in layers and there's metric C. So, and then there's another distinction in liquid crystals the thermotropics, which are temperature dependent, they, they do phase transitions according to temperature, as in display devices. And then there is the biotropics that form liquid crystal phases by changing the molecular concentration in a solvent. 
And now we focus on this water-based, so hydrotropic, which I call biological liquid crystals. And these biological liquid crystals are nothing else than chromonic. So chromonic liquid crystals are formed by water-based uh, plant-like molecules with rigid cores and ionic groups in the periphery. So this is a typical molecule, and I think here the one I'm showing you is the so-called disodium uh, chromolicate, which is an antiasmatic drug. And you see this is a representation of the actual molecule, but for all purposes you can imagine that they are like coins, okay, like disks. Then what happens? So uh, if you imagine this coin and with very different chemical properties, say on the flat faces or on the sides, then you can form these structures. So basically the flat faces are hydrophobic. So they want to find another flat face, whereas the sides are hydrophilic and they want to be near the wall. And this is really the whole, what drives the whole thing. So then uh, when the concentration of these molecules in water is very small, so you have maybe, you know, small packages, and if you look at the axis of the cylinders, the axis of the cylinders are aligned in any direction. Okay, so it's isotropic. Now, when you increase the concentration of these molecules, then they tend to form uh, longer columnar structures, and these columnar structures tend to become more aligned. So that's the normal phase. And then finally, when you have still higher concentration, then these columns grow a little more, but uh, there is a limit on how much they can grow, and then they get together. So, and they form these clumps of uh, six molecules surrounding the central one. And of course, uh, this gives a, a very distinctive uh, hexagonal structure that we can see in the experiments. So then a typical phase transition for uh, these lyotropic chromonics is from isotropic to pneumatic to hexagonal or columnar, the word names are used, as the concentration increases. So from now on, whenever we do uh, talk about the director, so the director uh, is, say, tends to be parallel to this uh, columnar group. So basically, you could think of, for many purposes, a columnar group as representing a, a kind of rod-like molecule of the traditional liquid crystals. So the thing that is, the, what's really special about the hexagonal phase is that uh, it is liquid, right, in this direction, in the long direction, however, in the perpendicular direction behaves like a two-dimensional crystal. So you have a two-dimensional solid in a perpendicular direction to the liquid direction, which is the columnar one. Okay, so now here I'm going immediately to uh, the experiments. Okay, so now we do experiments with these materials. So what happens? So basically, how do we go from these columnar faces to these structures. So at this point, the experimentalists add in the water what are called condensing agents. Condensing agents are basically very, very big ions that tend to kind of stuff things together. So then as soon as they put those condensing agents, this whole thing, the whole thing kind of falls apart, right? And then when it uh, kind of rearranges, then these structures appear. So lots and lots of toruses all over the place. <laughs> so, structures like this, okay? So, um, I think there's a certain one here that basically are toruses, I will tell you what they are. So then, um, so these are free, freely suspended toros. And also one feature is that they got uh, facets right? and uh, um, corners, okay? So they are not smooth uh, toruses. And so this is an illustration, an artist's illustration of how the columns uh, look like in the bulk. Okay? So you see here you have like these columns packed, if you want, uh, in a torus. And now here there is a very different structure which has, uh, is characterized by, by two perpendicular defects. And this one we're not dealing with. We haven't yet figured out how to model this, but we're dealing with this. Yes. So, and then, uh, also in the same experiment, you see a lot of half toruses, okay? These half toruses, so instead of the really suspended shapes, 
What we have is that these guys are partial toruses that kind of get stuck to the substrate. Okay? And in fact, then you're having a competition between, say, the surface energy uh, in the water with the surface energy of this liquid crystal in, a, in the crystal in the plate uh, substrate. And then whoever wins is going to pull the torus towards, you know, in contact with the liquid, right? And uh, of course, that's all an energy competition. We have done a lot of the, our studies and calculations, especially the characterization of the shapes with this because they are a little bit easier to deal with. So, and these different images that you see here just happen at different concentrations. The reason why they prefer to attach to the bottom plate is mostly due to the gravity and homeotropic anchoring. Okay, and now this is, uh, let's say, the analog situation with DNA. This is in vitro DNA. So here we see a, chromo a cryogenic image of a DNA condensate in free solution, showing again toroidal shape with an hexagonal cross-sectional lattice. So this guy, the outer diameter is 100 nanometers, the inner hole is 30 nanometers. And this is not quite sure, it needs a good study, but it looks like Francois Le Voland in 1978, and um, you know, in, the, in this, this Paris group, it was perhaps the first to identify um, the liquid crystal nature of DNA. So it's not clear yet. There might be, so this is something that I have to find out one more. And this is from the, this paper by Kutten Miller. And one thing I didn't uh, emphasize, oh, what was that here? Okay, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> I think I must have forgotten the test this. Okay. Oh, thank you, thank you, yes. Okay, so all I wanted to say here is that, uh, you see, to see the size, um, there is a, here a scale bar, the scale bar here, that's 20 microns. Okay, just to see some comparisons. Okay, so uh, then there is a reason to try to find the mathematical structure of why uh, these two sets are the same. And now here comes the third, which is our viruses. And, uh, I think we'll have very little time to go into the math of this, but basically you see here what are called the capsids. So here we're talking about these viruses that infect bacteria, bacteriophage viruses, that when there is no bacteria they like in the environment, uh, by means of a molecular water, they spool themselves into a box, one of these capsids. And supposed to be one of the strongest molecular motors in nature. And then they stay there until uh, they sense bacteria in the environment, in which case the capsid opens here, right? And they just leave at a very, very high speed. Now, um, what happens, it's important, so from an evolution point of view, it is important for them to be very well organized because if they are messed up, in particular, if the DNA has a lot of knots, then they might not be able to really emerge when it's time. And so they cannot infect. So in a way, the, the arrangement is meant to allow for a very efficient infection. So that's why we want to start that. And so now this is a cross-section, right? And uh, this is a cryo image. And now what you see here, say, take any of these, these are different viruses. And I think here, one of these is our virus. Uh, we just, those people in uh, UC Davis had uh, generated it. But anyway, you see here like an ordered um, region. And then in the middle, something that looks more messed up. And that is called the core. Okay. So uh, the lines that you see around this capsid, uh, are not really the DNA themselves, but these are the projections. So if we had to see the DNA here, the DNA would come out of this and it would be perpendicular to the board. So what we see is the projection of the ends on the, on the board. Okay. And let's see, so... Um, and these cores are disordered, very little is known about them, and actually we have done different studies of this, 
because it's not clear if this is actually disordered or it is actually, uh, you know, because the way images are taken, that several cross sections come together. And so we have mathematical studies for different proposals. So uh, today I'm, I'm not going to talk about this today and more about the quiescent state. And I don't know, this time maybe this is our most newer uh, thing, is not published yet, but it's kind of very exciting. So, by the way, here um, in the quiescent state, due to this organization, so liquid crystals are kind of helping where the infection dynamics you already leave liquid crystals behind. So, they don't grow. Okay, so let's see. So, we talked about a little bit about chromonic liquid crystals, the clusters that, the, the clusters that they form, then look at some, we're going to look at uh, typical free boundary problems, and then how to come out with, how to really uh, mathematically come up with columns and facets, and if time, victory of its viruses, and then conclusions. And then here these are, I gave you the references in the abstract, and these are perhaps the main ones that will be using a list at the beginning. And of course, to remember everybody, well, you know, what is the, the main staple energy in liquid crystals, right? Is your seen frank energy, right? Where you have the divergence term, you have the, the twist, and you have the bending term. So this term is going to be very important. And uh, this, well, I'll show you in a moment, that this pretty much uh, kind of getting used to constraints. And this, of course, is the normal Lagrangian term that the normal Lagrangian term that you know, at least doesn't show a lot of effects on this. And as you know, then we have uh, existence, so when the uh, frank uh, inequalities are satisfied, and we had the main paper was uh, hacking the little links. Okay, now here, uh, just been you know, about a minute or so, and talking about what is the energy of these hexagonal chromatic liquid crystals. So, okay, so here we have two fields, the director field and the field that we call U, okay, a displacement vector, basically. And so you have the UC frank energy, okay, and then there is an hexagonal energy. So this is the liquid crystal energy of this direction, and this is the solid energy of the cross section with lattice vectors M and P, right, and then the perpendicular. This is also called cohesive energy because it's the one that holds uh, the structure together. Now, the first proposal that I know of a surface energy goes back to the Jans in 1974, who wrote something like this, uh, thinking more in a linear context. So, uh, B is the ball modulus of the elastic media, and C is the shear modulus. For uh, then, in the, for there are non-linear elastic studies of this and proposals, uh, which you could find in the world in the book by Oswald and Piransky, uh, much later in 2005. Okay, so once we have this, so how does a typical problem look like? A typical free boundary problem, and I have quite a few of those, right? So first of all, um, we look for minimizers of. Um, bending energy, right? The bending of these columns, plus the surface energy. Okay, omega would be, say, one of these typical processes. Now, you want to minimize this subject to the constraints of zero divergence and zero curl. Now, uh, these liquid crystal columns, so, are tangent to the boundary, okay, to the boundary of the, the, the aggregate, and then the volume is fixed. So nu is the unit surface normal. Okay, I put this in green because this is really a geometric constraint. Uh, if you have a columnar structure, right, unless there is those locations, uh, if you take a plane, say, perpendicular to the column, as many columns are going to come in as are going to emerge. So, and of course, you have to have zero divergence for that. And this is because uh, we find for these particular materials a lot of bending, a lot of twist resistance. Okay, so aggregates are very resistant to layer twist, and bending is the dominant mode of deformation. And then what is important is an isotropic surface tension. So this sigma zero is the isotropic part, and this is, uh, which depends on end or new, so the director 
uh, top product <coughs> to the boundary. Uh, this, this. So now uh, you could ask, well, if I have presented an hexagonal energy before, how come I'm not using it? And here's the thing. So um, for chromatic aggregates in the isotropic phase, we neglect this hexagonal energy, okay? Because the surface energy is enough to kind of hold things together, to play the cohesive role. However, uh, this hexagonal energy is fundamental uh, when we talk about uh, arrangements of viral DNA. And, okay, so for more... May, can I ask a quick question? Yes. So this boundary condition you have here, the normal dotted with N is zero. Yes. That's a hard constraint, but are you going to relax it now? Yeah. Brought... yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yes, I should have relaxed it here. That's very good, yes. Yeah, this, this would be really a case of uh, getting yes. okay, So I guess for these purposes, well, this, this would to be for this purpose, I don't want this, but thank you for that. Okay, so now just a very quick remark where this is going to, of course, uh, we have known the important work on here, uh, here is in, uh, uh, droplets of liquid crystals, uh, so, uh, uh, crystal droplets, and studies of the shapes of electrical device drops by Rovelli. And in this case, it was capillary energy plus voltage. And then the wolf construction as an electrotropic surface energy. Okay, so now, um, pneumatic droplets. So, Lin and Poon uh, in 1986 studied uh, convex domains. Uh, and constraint, no constraints in the energy, one constant of synchron model. And then later, I believe also in one, uh, solid polymer dispersed liquid crystals where uh, no convexity assumptions were made. And these were really um, domains of liquid crystals that form within a polymer network. Uh, the main study or the main issue here is the regularity. And then uh, for what it has to do with our analysis, uh, we had a studies of bipolar droplets uh, like you know a while ago. Now, works on liquid crystal droplets are really ubiquitous in the literature, with many open problems. So I couldn't even start, uh, you know, with mentioning the ones, all the ones that are, uh, uh, you know, confined. And then there is uh, indirectly we touch on the argument and girting the anisotropic motion of material surfaces. Okay, so now here there is a, a boundary, property boundary that we tackled, and I have to keep track of my time. So, so this basically wants to, is a, one of these aggregates, right, on its own isotropic soup. And so here we have omega is the chromonic cluster, and then we have a surrounding isotropic phase. And here we, um, so this is for the isotropic, so sigma one is zero. So that's where the boundary condition is coming in. Okay, so in the zero K3 and sigma, we want to find a measurable non-connected set omega and a function n in H1, such that the pair minimizes the energy that I showed you. Okay, and that's... Uh, Can you um, remind me how the energy depends on omega? Um, let's see. Okay, it's basically the domain of integration. Okay, and it's, so, uh, let's see, where is that? Yeah. Of the torus. Yeah. Yeah. So this is omega is unknown. Okay. But omega is the free surface. No. 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 Omega is unknown. It's where the uh, the aggregate the space that the aggregate is going to so occupy. The three dimensional volume. Yes. Torus. Yeah. The three dimensional volume. Yes. And this is the boundary of that. Okay. So and again, this boundary condition is. Uh, the isotropic case when sigma 1 is 0, and in the anisotropic case, of course, this is the surface energy. Okay, so now you want to find uh, pairs, um, director field, and uh, domain. So here we did this for um, without constraints. Well, let's see, this is for the case. Uh, um, the constraint case is the limit of this, right? And for this, we find an energy minimizing pair that has this immutable profile, where omega is a torus. Any other configuration has higher energy. So if we let 
k1 and k2 has got to infinity, then we are in the um, constraint problem that I showed you before. So basically, one important point about all these energy systems, <coughs> how complicated they seem, they seem is that uh, are always polyconvex, at least for the large range of parameters. So now, uh, basically, here's the sketch of uh, how this goes. So and there is a, a result that uh, very often people kind of um, bypass, and it's, I think, very useful. So first started with the result by Ericsson in 1964, and then Maris um, made it more um, maybe specific to some situations. And it's really the classification of all possible critical points of the Eocene Frank energy. So critical points, no boundary conditions in the bulk. So, and here I just put three, but there is actually six, right? So you can actually have the formulas. Okay, so then basically here, what you want to say is, well, uh, this is the one that is relevant to us. So I am going to look for a class of uh, vector lines of N, uh, in the form of concentric circles, okay? Uh, because going through the list, right, I see that we have the only ones that satisfy boundary conditions, okay? So then you have identified, say, how would the critical point be, say, in the bulk? And then, of course, you construct a family of minimizing sequence of not connected domains with polling the zero as envelopes of this concentric vector field filling the whole space, okay? And then you cut out the torus out of this with R1 and R2, the inner and outer radius, right? And at that point, you identify the R1 and R2 that uh, uh, give you, that correspond to this minimum. Now, you can do a perturbation, okay? So we do a perturbation and uh, look at the second variation Right? And we see that any other uh, shape or any other, um, say, direct arrangement other than the concentric would produce higher energy. Okay, so that's kind of the sketch of uh, um, this particular problem. But then, of course, remember that here I did not um, I didn't assume an isotropic surface energy. So the surface energy is fully isotropic. Okay. So now we are going to go to another view of this, okay? Because actually what we are going to see is that an isotropy, and like in many problems of this form, an isotropy of the surface energy is really responsible for corners and facets. So and here we are going to get a very simplified model. Okay. So we assume that the toroidal aggregate, toroidal aggregate of volume zero is obtained as a rotation about the z-axis, right, of a region in the plane, so this region little omega, we rotate it about the z-axis and that forms this um, three-dimensional domain. By the way, it is not necessary that omega is a circle, it could have, you know, could be any other shape. And, okay, so then, um, the thing about, well, the point is that uh, the problem Let's reduce to two dimensions. Okay. And uh, let's see, coordinates. So we have the Z coordinate, and then we have the rho coordinate. So we parameterize the whole domain in terms of these two coordinates. Theta is this angle, right? So in other words, this is the angle between the tangent and the x-axis, right? Nu is a normal. And then the boundary has this profile uh, delta omega. Okay. So this is a sketch or a representation of the toroidal nucle nucleus, and this is a cross-section by a vertical plane that gives this two-dimensional domain with boundary partial omega. Moreover, here we assume that the columnar aggregate is composed of circular chromonic columns. In other words, we just freeze n to be is a theta. Okay, so they come exactly in this direction. So then when we take that energy, okay, um, well, it's very simple. Okay. Uh, by the way, kappa positive is the curvature of the boundary. And then, uh, well, at some point we regularize the energy. But uh, this has already been scaled, it's non-dimensional. 
So this part here is the bending energy. Okay, then an integral on omega on the cross section. And now this is the surface energy, or actually the line energy now, on the boundary. So this sigma is the energy per, un per unit length. And now, so we want to minimize this functional subject to the volume constraint, say, equals B0. I'm going to keep B0, but uh, it's already one. Okay. So, but now, of course, we need to regularize the energy because uh, otherwise, you know, there's problems with, um, especially with uh, numerical analysis of this. So, and then we uh, regularize it with um, the curvature. So, that's the curvature as well. This parameter beta, oops, thank you. This parameter beta is easy to remember. So, this is the ratio of the bending to surface energy. I should rather say bending to, in this case, is line energy. So beta large means that we have a situation where bending dominates, and beta small is mostly surface energy dominating. So when um, beta is small, then somehow our results should look a lot like uh, the geometry of curves that uh, in terms of Frank and um, Wolf construction. Okay. And okay, that's how the associated Lagrangian looks like. So the function of j, and this lambda is the Lagrange multiplier that holds on this volume constraint. Now, these other Lagrange equations are the second order of these, for this would be a parameterization of the boundary, right, and lambda. So the main issue is to, of course, identify singularities, corners, and facets, and uh, as a motivation, we use geometrical methods using Frank's diagrams, and I'll tell you the role that they play for us. But first of all, let us take a look at the system, right? So when we parameterize the boundary curve, S is the arc length between 0 and L, R at L is equal to R at 0, and the size of them, we look, we look for uh, singular solutions, in other words, the corners that will have an undefined curvature, and where uh, the angle, the tangent angle, is not differentiable. And so we get um, these equations, okay? And um, one of them, of course, uh, in principle, it should be two, but one of them is, uh, is uh, kind of, well, when we make it into uh, the first of the equations, we kind of introduce an extra variable, so that's the usual thing. And, and these are all the boundary conditions that we have. So if the zero is plus two pi is theta L, the derivatives are the same, zero and L, and that is a periodicity condition, and this is basically the volume constraint. Now, one thing that we get out of here is that we can uh, obtain a first integral from this equation. Okay, so we can we integrate it. So basically, we multiply by theta, okay? yeah, and uh, we get this constant, right? D is an arbitrary constant. So then, just thinking about you know the role of the system, of the coordinate system. So what is clear from here is that the flat facets may only be present if when they are parallel to the z-axis. In other words, when rho is constant, rho constant would be the only solution to this equation. And of course, that is something that we had already seen in the experiments. Uh, okay, so now uh, I want to get some insights from the Frank diagram on the surface energy. Of, the surface energy. of course, uh, in this problem we cannot apply this directly, but on the other hand, it gives a uh, it gives some insights. So, uh, as I said before, if the surface energy dominates, then what we get should be very close to this Frank and Wolf analysis uh, predict. But on the other hand, if the bulk energy is comparable to the surface energy or bigger, then things are going to be different. So, and here I'm just going to remind a little bit, uh, you know, the main points of this. 
So this is out of the references by Gertin and Anginand. So the Frank diagram associated with sigma um, is convex. So sigma now is uh, the surface energy and the same location. So this is what is also called a stability condition of the energy. Okay. And this for all three things, zero pi. And then in this case, uh, the curve uh, R, the profile curve cannot have corners. If the Frank diagram is not convex, then R has corners but not cusps. So, and the angles at which the kernels occur are fixed by the Frank diagram and are well separated if the, match, if the Maxwell lines have no common points. In other words, what is called the regular diagram. For example, this is, uh, I will show you one of the parameters that we have used, but uh, this would be a Frank diagram from one of, of our examples. Uh, it's non convex. And then we see that uh, it has six Maxwell lines. Okay, so this kind of protrusion here and this have a common tangent. So that is a Maxwell line. So this protrusion and the next one have a common tangent, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Okay, so this would indicate that for parameters of this form, right, uh, there are uh, six facets in the shape and six corners. Okay, but again, this is just an indication because uh, if we have a larger, uh, more dominant bending energy, then it's not going to be quite the same. Um, also, you're going to see that in our analysis, things are a little bit rounded up, and that's due to the regularization. Okay, so now from here on, we start uh, say the rigorous analysis of the system that I showed you before. So it's a fairly nonlinear system of all years, right? And um, so, and kind of bounded value problems and all this somehow could be a bit challenging. So this is a bit challenging, but nothing that you can handle, right? So, um, and here there is one key result that otherwise none of this would work. So remember that um, here, right, we have, and I put it in green, a large multiplier, okay? So now we have to, what we want to do is a rescaling of these variables to eliminate the Lagrange multiplier. Can I mean, there's just one small detail, the, the curvature term, this regularization, I, I guess I'm not seeing it in this equation. Where, where is that? Yeah, it comes. Uh, let me see. Okay, let's see here. Um, it's, it's already written in terms of derivatives of theta. So it's, it's included. Otherwise, we would not be able to analyze it. So basically, just write the curvature in terms of the derivatives of the angle. That's all. So it's a kind of okay. Okay. So then, what is essential in this analysis is the positivity of the Lagrange multiplier. Okay. So now we assume that we have a solution that is this white smooth and convex. Then the Lagrange multiplier has to be positive. So uh, this allows. It allows us to rescale the problem, eliminating lambda, and then we can rigorously prove existence of solutions on smooth segments. On smooth segments. In other words, we first do this proof without any uh, corners, okay? And then, uh, if you have, say, a finite number of corners, you can um, put together the, uh, the proofs for the solutions for the different pieces. Okay, this is. Uh, fairly lengthy and there's a lot of bookkeeping, but nothing special and one would expect that. And at that point, we are, you know, we can, we have a system, but it does not have a Lagrange multiplier anymore. I didn't show you the changes of variables. It's kind of everything is a bit lengthy. I think it's one of our, in one of our papers. But right now, so this is static, but since the condition for minimizing the energy are really nonlinear, so then what we do is apply a gradient flow of the Lagrangian to compute equilibrium states. So, first of all, now we parameterize the boundary by time and define a velocity 
to be minus the shape gradient of the boundary. So this is an approach. I guess it has been very much popularized by the Nocetto group, this derivatives of uh, you know, free boundaries. So what is basically a gradient. And so what this gradient is all that um, <laughs> in other words, decreases, right? And with the time varying constraint that conserves the ball. Okay, so then once we have uh, this, uh, say, gradient flow equation, then we just set up its weak formulation and discretize it. We discretize it in continuous, piecewise, linear, finite element space. And at that point, just use the Euler Packard method to solve it. Okay, so these are some of the numerical experiments. So this is for this interfacial energy, right? So this is already non-dimensionalized and this has one to one. And this is the regularization parameter that involves the square of the curvature then to the minus four. And then this is for the anisotropic energy one and two. And then we have three values of beta that are decreasing. So out of these three cases, B21 is the one that has higher bending energy with respect to um, surface energy. So one here, here in this one, say, the surface energy would dominate. So when we have very high bending energy, then um, say the torus is going to have a big hole because remember that uh, the actual torus comes when we rotate the shape about this vertical axis, right? So, and of course, if the curvature, if the bending penalty is very big, then uh, it doesn't want to curve very much. And the way to do that is, of course, if it stays away from the axis, right? So now, um, this case, already, um, the bending energy is not as penalizing, and now you see that the hole of the donut is going to be a lot smaller, right? So it's a lot closer, and this one, it's even closer. And now the rest, it kind of reorganizes itself so that it can accommodate the volume V0. Okay, and now here there is a slightly different case, uh, because these numbers, of course, we do not have a physical theory of how to choose sigma 1, so this is very phenomenological, so, is, so what happens when you do this and you choose different values, right? And uh, well, in principle, you see the only assumption we have is that sigma has to be positive, right? And so if we take now, say, the sigma one, yeah, the coefficient of the anisotropic piece to be negative, so basically what we get are the same uh, profiles for the same betas, but uh, rotated by an angle of pi over three. Okay, so now, okay, so here maybe just a few minutes to talk about that. So now this is a switch of problems. Um, so what do we do when, you know, to model now virus? So when we do, when we go to uh, battery offages. So this is one of the features I showed you at the beginning. So M and P is the hexagonal lattice, the DNA is coming perpendicular to the board and it was coming to us. And then this is how this would look like, say, in, in a simulation. And this is my uh, collaborators, Arzuaga and Vasquez, uh, that they did a good part of simulation. Now, um, we have the core, so more or less you can see here the core, where there is disorder. And of course, this disorder core is to avoid excessive bending energy, because if the DNA has to keep coiling as it gets closer and closer to the center, uh, the curvature is very big, so the bending energy will be huge. So then uh, it gets disorganized. Okay. So then uh, our problem is to determine the organization, the organized part, and the disorder core. We don't know where the disorder core is, so that makes it a free boundary problem. Okay, so 
And now we see these problems are very different than the ones that we are using in material sciences, because you just don't go to a table and find the numbers, right? So you have to see how you get your information. So what do we have at our disposal? So we have the cryogenic images. And from these images, we can get density graphs and we can get the size of this disorder core. So then we know the diameter, the effective diameter of the DNA, and we know the genome length, then we know the persistent length, in other words, that's what uh, uh, basically gives the K3. And, uh, and then we know there's some measurements of bulk and shear moduli uh, for uh, semi-flexible polymers, and then we know pressure measurements and we know ejecting forces. So out of this, we have to determine, come up with the parameters of the model. Okay, so the vending model is, is like this. And so here there is with another typo. We should have it multiplied by the persistent length. So the persistent length, basically, it is the minimum length where you cannot bend beyond that. Okay, so and high, very high bending resistance means that this persistent length is big. And again, I apologize. Uh, it's on the it should be here. And then this is um, a little density. And um, a lot of these setups in different ways were really uh, done in uh, papers. And this is this, they, well, they did different energies and then we move on. Okay, so that's how now a free boundary problem would look like. Okay, so we might have um, see the divergence uh, at here. And now you see here omega zero. Omega zero is this isotropic disorder core, the inner part where we cannot bend anymore, right? And so this has an isotropic energy basically proportional to its volume that we don't know. And then there is um, Generalization of the area of this core because it is observed that it's fairly sharp the difference between um, what is organized and what is not. Okay, and these are uh, the unit vectors that we saw in the columnar phase. And then a uh, new is the energy density of the isotropic phase, which we borrow from the Unsager precision model, mm -hmm. the isotropic part. And then sigma is the surface energy density. Uh, and again, here I'm assuming that is um, isotropic. So and this is coming from the non-standard toy approach. And B and C are the bulk and shear modelers that come from uh, Dijan's elastic energy. But uh, here we have to do elastic energy for a material that is made of fibers. And this uh, kind of results into this different expression of the original Dijan's energy. So this is, if you want to think about it, is uh, very close to the asymmetric energies where we have to have, uh, we have to preserve, say, interlaying distance. So that's how this comes up. And since we are kind of getting short in time, I'm just going to show you the very first uh, run of this, that uh, it is, it was really, um, a way to fit parameters. Okay, so here we consider half of the cap set, right? This blue region is where we would have the DNA organized, and this white region here that we take as a spheroidal, that is where the DNA is disordered, isotropic. Okay, so uh, and let's look at these parameters. So we don't know this parameter, which is the maximum radius of this spheroid. So now we kind of, well, we assume we kind of set N to be um, just a C-module. Okay? Go to that energy that I just showed you. And sure enough, that energy now becomes very simple as a function of this core. Okay? Because this core radius, A here. And the energy in terms of this core radius really has a minimum right somewhere at 0.5. Okay, so, and of course, uh, we minimize the energy with respect to this core radius, and this method allows for parameter assessment. 
And here are the results that we got. So we tested this on four viruses. These viruses have persistent lengths given by these numbers. Then the interdiameter separation, or say, let's say the effective diameter of the DNA is given by this. Say effective diameter because of these charges. And it means that they have and they repel. So DNA repels itself, right? So it's always a little bit farther apart than what it should be. And this is the length of the genome. So here, this is a very big virus in nanometers, 55,000. Uh, the epsilon 15 is very small. It's one of the smallest we dealt with. And this is the radius of the capsid. This is the ratio of the core radius that this is obtained by, uh, the disorder core obtained by imaging respect to the radius of the capsid. This is experimental. And this is what we get from this model. So at this point, we were confident that we could really use this, you know, more in prime time to go and model away. <clears throat> so right now, I think I'm going to pass this uh, issue. So this is a finite element simulation of one of these, where the core is uh, the blue part is the disordered part. So we have a bunch of this, this is packing. And I just go directly to the conclusions just to give you an idea of how, well, how this fits together. So here we basically have studied three bounding problems for toroid or chromonic nuclei in their isotropic phase, so sitting on their isotropic soup, and the balance between surface and bending plays a crucial role in shape characterization. So in related work, we have analyzed the mechanical properties of this condensed DNA in the capsid and predicted pressures between 20 and 50 uh, atmospheres inside. Okay? And that is where the hexagonal energy plays a role. Just to kind of remind you that this is a huge pressure for those nanometer sized things. Uh, if you take a bottle of champagne, right? An open bottle of champagne is 10 atmospheres. Okay. So it's really amazing of how, you know, how that can happen in that. <laughs> so an additional isotropic phase is predicted at the core of the capsid to, predict, to prevent exceedingly large bending energies. Now, electric interactions, because when in these experiments, you know, we always have lots and lots of ions, right? So, but in the toroidal nuclei, so this ions do not seem to play any significant role. However, they are essential in DNA modeling. So then we have coupled this mechanical model that I show you with the poisson bowman nurse planck to account for this kind of interaction. So DNA-DNA, ion-ion, and DNA-ion. And this, of course, uh, one of the ions can come in and out of the capsid because uh, the capsid is permeable and then you have really a problem with the uh, two regions, the inner and the outer region. So that appeared in the biophysics journal a while ago. And now the more recently, of course, you can ask, well, the DNA is very different from the, you know, the toroidal nucleus because those have molecules, right? And this the DNA is a very, very long piece, right? So we have the issue of conductivity, right? In other words, at the end of the day, we need to get at least the center curve of the DNA, which is a curve which is tangent to to the director field of the problem almost everywhere. So, however, the presence of torsion energy yields helical minimizers for realistic parameter values. So, in this case, the concentric circles under parameters that we're looking at are not anymore the minimizers. Instead, you have helices. And, of course, one thing that you might ask is as long as you use a sin frank, you cannot account for any defects. So, there are defects which in particular, knots, okay, crossings and twist knots. That those are very uh, relevant in this. So then we can actually translate those in Frank into the Q tensor model of landau and account for the fix. And now we recently are working on the dynamics of infection where the liquid crystals are all gone. And you just have a kind of an interesting uh, bar, right, a road that moves on the liquid. And thank you very much, sorry, just.